So, hi, this is Ben Affleck. I'm the director of the movie and an actor in the movie, and I'm here with Chris Terrio, the author of the movie, the writer, and uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit. Well, author. I don't know. I think author's good. I don't, I don't think the, the director is, is, a, is a good author. The auteur? The writer, the screenwriter. I think you're the author. The person who typed things that were said. <laughs> so here you see we saw the original Warner Brothers logo, which we got Warner to give us permission to use. This sequence here was kind of created for two purposes. One was to use this sort of storyboard feel to tune the audience into the sort of Hollywood uh, the quasi-comic tone that would happen later, you know, to foreshadow that a little bit and tell them, hey, look, it's not just going to be hard history, but it's actually going to have uh, this, this storytelling theme in it that's going to be presented in a slightly unusual way. And we put some grain and scratches and dirt on this stuff to sort of segue from that logo into our movie to make it feel old, to put it in the audience's mind that they're watching something from a long time ago. You can see all the dirt and scratches and stuff there shows up as, as dirt on film shows up as white. By the same token, it, I thought it was really important to contextualize the history, the politics, you know, in this sort of coarse and, and brief and broad brush, broad stroke away as could fit into two minutes. The people starve. This is a famous shot here of the peasant kissing the Shah's foot. I thought an educated audience, you know, an audience that was educated about Iran would appreciate the movie more because they would have a context for it. We wanted to use this sort of melding in and out of real footage and into this sort of fantastical land. That's the queen, Shah's wife. She was in a beauty contest, evidently. I like that statue falling down. It sort of uh, has echoes of Saddam Hussein. There's two million people that were really at the airport when Khomeini came back. The helicopter couldn't land because people wouldn't get out of the way and there were so many of them. It descended into score settling. That's Death a real award-winning photograph, that yeah. firing squad. You know, it's pretty horrible. It almost looks like the Spanish Civil War, you know, that famous photograph. It's like yeah. these photographs just repeat throughout history. The Iranian people took to the streets outside the U.S. Embassy. I like there's like Star of David, swastika, and money on that symbol. Like they weren't quite sure what to... What they were opposed to. <laughs> right. And of course, this is the famous takeover which when we were making the movie, we didn't anticipate that it would have some of the similarities that it, that it, it now does to current events, you know, the embassy in Cairo and the, the attack in Benghazi and so forth. But what, what I really wanted to do with this was just to make it feel as immediate and as urgent as possible. That's just mostly Super 8 footage. That's 35 right there. This guy, that's replicating a, an event that really happened, a guy kind of manically stabbing an effigy. They, they had uh, posters of the uh, headshots of people who had been killed by the Shah. This is the big sort of crane shot that I had, and everything in the far distance is um, is digital people, and, I, and everything on the left is all digital. That was a soccer field, and it was completely recreated or created, um, you know, co imitating, I think, pretty well the uh, the embassy. And Swift, and so kind of going back and forth from this stuff, and using CG and the extras, and this is in, this was shot in front of a green screen in the abandoned VA facility in uh, North Hills, California, and the other stuff was shot in Turkey, so it was hard to kind of keep track of what we were doing and I wanted to establish this sort of loud outside chaos when hearing that and hearing that inside the sort of distant threat the ominousness we had these extras who were just kind of great um, that woman is amazing I mean you imagine that she got dressed up that day to go to the embassy and try to get her visa and and later there's a, you have another shot of her that I think is brilliant and this stuff was like we brought all these 35 millimeter cameras and all this equipment and the best footage was like the super 8 just handheld <laughs> This is our big, you know, effects shot here. The embassy and the crowds completely created. But this stuff, I think, is the most powerful. And this is all super great. You see the saturation and the contrast and the punch. And it's the most powerful. It looks like old news footage. But there's no old footage in this whatsoever. This is all new stuff. Because you just gave super eight cameras to people and put them in the crowd. So they are, in fact, shooting the thing that somebody at the actual rally would have been shooting. We need some security. Yes, it's, and it's, it's your it's responsibility. They're over the walls. We should all split. I'm going to close up my office. <laughs> I like that overhead shot. It's a representation of like a, a more determined crowd inside a kind of general. And here you see the role of the women in this. You know, women in some places were calling the shots about how, how it was going to proceed, which is an interesting thing. Yeah, as part of it was obviously the thrust of it was a student's uh, protest, and you know, a lot of women were, were a part of that. And in fact, a lot of the protest was based on things like Berkeley sit ins, because a lot of the, lead the student leaders of the revolution had been educated in the U.S., and so there was. While we might think of it as, you know, the, the the sort of streets of the Middle East, there was also an element of the 60s protest movement to, to it. And that was the model they had. I wanted to have these guys, this sort of sense of, of dread that the cameras were getting knocked off and that, you know, slowly this was, this sort of floodwaters were rising. I like the indifferent policemen there. Don't fucking shoot anybody. And we sort of went back and forth on how much to have uh, Golchinsky here say, you know, that they're going to be 
they're going to be killed and don't start a war. And ultimately, I think we found a good balance. <laughs> This is th this this sort of quotidian sense of the lives of these employees that they're just doing their jobs. They're just stamping visas. You know, they're they're not espionage people. They're not here doing shady foreign policy things. I think is important because as the movie goes on, you have these six innocent people that 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 are caught up in these big political historical events. And I, I think that's in a way at the at the at the core of the mission in the movie. Last resort only. Some of this stuff. Those guys were all uh, real military guys that I used, and they just had a sort of sense that you, know, you believed them in this because you know they'd done this, they'd trained to do this. A lot of them were back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and wanted to get into movies. And uh, I find that like hiring veterans is always so uh, it's so rewarding because you know, they're just so talented. That's a shout of the extra who just like kind of was in the moment there. Um, but anyway, hardworking and gifted and, and uh, also quite realistic in those roles. Here we wanted to have a just sort of chaos of overlapping dialogue and, uh, you know, fear and this d debate and this lack of clarity about what's happening and, you know, just that sense of panic, you know. Going outside. Mine! The reason we... This is a hard thing to do because I didn't want to make it like a bad decision. He, he, in truth, he had been outside and talked to some people before. Um, and I wanted to make it seem like he thought it was a reasonable thing to do and immediately turned, um, you know, tragic. And they were used the access of the open door. This is all, all this whole, this takeover stuff is really taken from um, accounts of people. You know, it's, 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 it's rushed in this sequence, but, um, you know, these are all based on real people in doing the things that um, they were reported to have done, either by themselves or by others. It's, a, I think, a pretty good account of what happened. They were holding up the pictures of Khomeini. Some had pinned them to their shirts. As an almost totemic protection against what might happen to them, right? It was almost the only armor that they had were these photographs that they almost, by some accounts, wore as if they'd protect them from bullets. Here's them, like, breaking the visa plates. I always like that detail, the notion that, like, if they were going to come in there, they weren't going to get the plates to make visas to come to the United States. It doesn't seem like a real danger, but I love that there was a sort of d duty-bound sense to destroy them. This really happened. The, the incinerator uh, broke, and they had to use a shredder. And this was, like, one of the single biggest intelligence um, losses that the United States has ever suffered when they took over this embassy because they weren't able to shred very much. There was just a huge amount of material there, and it was a central embassy to that entire region. And to this day, the documents exist in a, in a museum in, in Tehran, right? This also apparently really happened. This guy found this dartboard Khomeini picture and went bananas. Well, I love <laughs> these guys crouching down. Like, it's going to help them to be under the table. It's done. Right. This is a tricky thing to figure out, like, what happened exactly. There's a the briefest homage to 9/11. There is on the wall there on the left, the notion that all of this stuff led to further events that were all part of the cycle that led to 9/11. Uh, okay, oh, we gotta get off the street. This way, up here to the left. all turkey dressed with Farsi and stuff and I thought it was pretty pretty good did a good job here you see that we, we emulated these stripes on the walls were at the State Department Kissinger painted them because he couldn't he was always getting lost so each floor had a different color coding and I think different areas as well and the orange is what's on the seventh floor which is the Secretary of State's office or is where the Secretary of State's office is it's confirmed sir six escaped I was told five no sir apparently it's six so what happened Not and it's, it is really in fact you know this wood paneled and kind of luxurious as opposed to the, the sort of sterile Kubrickian hallways that are outside um, I wanted to kind of create this sense of panic and uh, confusion and interdepartmental uncertainty right, something other than intelligence oh for the chief of staff Hotty. I'll call him back we're sticking to it no he did a great job he, he knew about Hotting Carter he 
um, you know, went to the same college. He put on a little weight to play him. Uh, he looked just like him. He just, he's one of the lovely little flourishes to me, if, uh, you know, um, among the actors who all really did a great job and all really did it kind of subtly. The embassy with guns to their heads right now. The whole world is watching the embassy. That makes them safer than the six on the street. Bonnie Sauter's saying it'll be over in 24 hours. We leave the six where they are. I'll go beat the press I like seeing Diane Sawyer and Ted Koppel there. I was that was important to use that footage to sort of connect what people were familiar with now to how it was then. At the time, they had no idea whether Khomeini would support the takeover and the U.S. government, and even what there was of the Iranian government thought it was going to be a, a quick, a quick thing. Rodrigo found that shot, that big wide shot, and that was nice. Here, you know, we're so accustomed to seeing the yellow ribbons and you know the the pray for our troops kind of stuff, and it, but it all really started then. You see, Tom Brokaw's got this kind of simple, clunky little set for the Today Show, and none of it's anything like the you know sexy theme music and crane shots and stuff we're used to seeing on HD with the news uh, now. And that would give a kind of visceral, immediate understanding of how long ago it was and the way the news was then. I wanted to establish Tony as a guy who was outside of his his own life here, you know, a little in exile, alone, and it's a, kind of a mess. We had to hurriedly put those... Uh, ribbons up and then take them down on the expressway because you weren't supposed to have them up. This is the real uh, CIA headquarters. We were lucky enough to be able to shoot here. We had to use visual effects to take down the post 9-11 barriers. And this is the real hallway and again we took out visually some some of the contemporary stuff, the stars on the wall, or the CIA members who died. But digitally some of them were removed because there weren't as many casualties. Yeah, as far did. fewer right. had died then than, you know, naturally than have now. This is, uh, you know, sort of aping the, um, all the president's men shots, moving through a lot of activity, open space, kind of a mess, you know, cigarette butts. I didn't want to do the slick CIA. I wanted to do the sort of work-a-day, lunch pail CIA. Which, in fact, is real, based on some of those photographs. So, I don't know how you got those photographs, but you, you had photographs of the actual uh, the pit in the CIA at that, at that moment. I had to wait to get them cleared for a long time. I loved to have the three networks on all the time, you know, that was, that was the only thing I had to watch. Guards going door to door like Jehovah's Witnesses. Half of them think that Khomeini's been too lenient on the ones in the embassy. What about the White House? That's the main hallway. Those are the portraits of the past directors there. Um, we had to take out visually, use those effects to take out a bust of George Herbert Walker Bush, which is in there. He was a former director, and then they named I guess, the building after him. Just the families. Meanwhile, some genius in our embassy was keeping a mug book on everybody. Who this was really important to sort of try to establish this idea of this, the oldest cliche in movies, which is the ticking clock, you know, the sense of urgency about this mug book. They're going to put it together. They're going to identify these guys. They're going to find them. And I liked how we couldn't use lights uh, in, in CIA, so you get this very cool blue on the back on our, the tungsten film because it's, it's daylight coming in, and uh, I think it lent this really nice sort of real quality to it. And these all extras we brought in to be like, in the CIA, <laughs> they, they were saying it's their most exciting day of being extras because they're like, usually it's like some church basement and then uh, in this thing it was the actual. And, and then afterward, I, I remember as the shoot was wrapping, there were people who were uh, sort of scanning and debugging that hallway that we were in to make sure that we hadn't left any recording. Surveillance equipment. devices, yeah. yeah. And now this building, we took it over, part of it over, and rebuilt conference rooms and offices and stuff. Thank you. All right. Mark and Cora Lightcheck, 29, 25. He's a consular officer. She's an assistant, newlyweds. They uh, only just got there a couple months ago. No language skills or in-country knowledge. Henry Lee Schatz, agricultural attache from Idaho. I was concerned this would be a little too similar to the town, like with the cutting away to the sort of eye of the filmmaker footage and having this poster board of, you know, sort of the suspects, but uh, I don't know. No one has complained yet. <laughs> Kathy? The embassy was understaffed, so the faculty wives were the type of employee. Shelko Ivanik and I co-starred together 20 years prior to this in a small film called School Ties. If you haven't seen it, run out and rent it immediately. Fortunately, we do not believe the Iranian... Chris Messina, who's in this scene, who's just a, playing Malinoff, is just a really good actor and underutilized in this movie, but excellent talent. And this was a tricky thing, balancing, you know, that we talked about balancing how we introduce Tony, whether he's sarcastic or, you know... If he's too sarcastic, or what it means to sort of uh, introduce him to the audience in the context of a guy who's sort of saying, you, know, you have the wrong idea, and I know what the right idea is, and that there's the danger of falling into the cliche of the sort of, he doesn't play by the rules, he wrote his own book sort of uh, caricature. 300 miles to the Turkish border. They need a support team following them with a tire pump. We were just asked to sharpshoot this. State is handling the odds. I'm sorry, who is this? And we ended up sort of really just soft playing it, I think. I think you hit it exactly right here because I, I think you, this is the audience, at least when, when I've seen, this is the moment, at least when I've seen it with an audience, when people 
understand that there's another slightly, you know, spitballing tone, drawing spitballs in class tone about about Tony, which I think is important to reconcile him to the other more sort of ironic comic elements of the movie. They could pose as reporters. The government issued 70-something visas for American journalists. And the Revolutionary Guards keep them on 74 leashes. If they're caught with fake journalist creds, it's Peter Jennings' head in a noose in an hour. Look, North American accents gives us limited options, so we get the Canadians to issue them passports. What about English teachers at the international school? It's a good idea. I just love the way this scene was written, you know, how it sort of bounced from... Um, you know, being about the the, bi the bicycles and the, the you know um, the, the NGO idea and that the kids are, are are African. You know, it always walked that line between sort of being you know a little too funny and being staying real. And I thought it kind of really feathered it nicely. You know, where it manages to be both real and kind of funny and absurd. And having everybody play it really straight somehow made it sort of lay in nicely. Where you never we never felt like I never wanted the audience to feel like we were winking at them or trying to make them laugh. Right. What's on the ground? Because all those ideas were real. They, they, they wanted. They, they did talk about bikes. They did talk about an NGO. They, they, they really had no, had no idea for a credible cover. X pills are like abortions. You don't want to need one, but when you do, you don't do it yourself. And the guy in the very end is Keith Sarabica, who's playing my immediate senior. And he and I did a after-school special together when I was 13. And he played the guy that was dating my mom, who was played by Madeline Kahn. A bit of a full circle here. This is one of these sequences where there's a couple in the movie. I really wanted to use these transitions to help knit together the separate tones in the movie. This was the last shot of the movie, last thing we did. You know, going from Tony here to to Iran, with where Tehran Mary is making a statement, and the, the um, you know the embassy where the hostages were being kept, and to slowly introduce the audience to this idea that we're going to be moving back and forth from the CIA to Iran, and then subsequent to this, you know, we have a transition uh, sort of montage that includes the the Hollywood stuff as well. And the first time you see them there, they're sort of down those Chris's idea to have the first time you see them be underneath there. And then we see them at dinner so they don't look too comfortable or relaxed. That was real stock footage um, of the people burning the Iranian flag. They knew exactly what was going to happen. They knew. But I don't understand what, what they should do now, send them back? Just to, to be some of these are scripted lines, and then some of them, Ben just allowed the actors to kind of improv. And, and he chose such interesting, intelligent actors who'd really done their homework for the... For the roles with the house guests in it so they they were in the heads of, of their characters and they they could improv like this like this is Clea and and victor improving it was a tough thing because they were in this nice house and uh, you know they would have dinner and that you know i mean doesn't look to the eye as urgently scary and so trying to you know accomplish that the crawl space obviously um helped you know and it helped to go to it first so that before I had a cut where you just jumped into them and they seemed to be like at a really nice dinner drinking out of goblets and it didn't seem that scary. This is one of the ugliest pieces of footage that we found, you know, where the crowd beats an Iranian protester. Which happens to be in front of the Beverly Hilton. Which, the, uh, which is where the, the read through was shot. Yeah. I loved this piece here and the one that Chris, Chris scripted, this one right here, Chris. You found this somewhere in your research, and this so this guy was in the screenplay, and I didn't, I wasn't sure he even really existed because it was so amazing. Well, that was a that was a gift at one at one low point in the writing process when I, I thought I didn't I didn't have any ideas to continue, and I went to the Paley Center, and uh, I found this footage of this guy talking about the movie Network, and of course, you know, anytime you're writing, you think about movies like Network, and so I I, I thought it was a sort of karmically significant that this guy was alluding to one of my favorite movies, and it, it gave me confidence to keep writing. Hello. Hi, ma'am. How's it, mom? I'm looking for you. Sort of designed this room after my own room when I was a kid. I'm exactly this kid's age. I was his age when this was, you know, happening. Um, so I really identified with him. And I liked, I loved the idea that it's his son who gives him this idea. So they're watching this. And I was, the one they were scripted, you know, the science fiction shows and stuff, I tried to adhere very closely to them. Can't be nothing. Something must happen. Mm-hmm. There's a line that was in the this script. This is the hell my forefathers spoke right. about. This is the hell my forefathers spoke of. I thought you made it up, but it turned out it was really in the movie. So uh, I'm not I'm not genius enough to script a, li a line like that. <laughs> this is an optical zoom, both of these, I, because it wasn't clear enough, sort of. I wanted to emphasize that he was getting this idea. So did this push in afterward. Shoot. Moonscape, Mars, desert, you know. Now imagine this. Here, you know, it's really important to me to have that energy of, of the pitch, you know, having to sell these, this guy. Tony's gotten this idea, and he's just flush with the energy of, of it, and um, now trying to sell it to this skeptical bunch. They're really a stand-in for the audience. Um, you know, as, as, as filmmakers, we need to explain to the audience why this sort of outlandish 
uh, premise of the movie is actually realistic. So it kind of had a dual purpose in terms of storytelling, but maybe more importantly, to to make this feel credible to the audience, because this is really the moment where you know this is the genesis of the idea. And, and so the people in the room were bringing up every objection that the audience might have in their heads. We're trying to preempt preempt objections. He's done a bunch of contract work for us in the past. I go see him. He sets us up. One, two days. Make it look real. This is a uh, guy, Rafi Pitts, who is an Iranian filmmaker, showed me a photograph of motorcycles driving across American flag, and it was painted backwards. And um, so you, I love that image, and I wanted to use it. And, and gets at, I think, a crucial theme, which is that the Iranian side understand the power of images and the power of photographed images, because that, that becomes really at the, at the heart, heart of the film. You did go outside. Okay, I saw you. Bob. Yeah, the storytelling theme I thought was really powerful, you know, used for political theater, and, you know, and how, just how much sort of power it gives you, who controls the narrative, um, has a lot of power, the sort of the camera is mightier than the gun idea. They said something totally different in the scene, but just for the sake of the movie, when I, I wanted to trim it and change it, I just uh, had them loop different Farsi and rewrite it, and they were in silhouette and kind of far enough away that it worked out fine. That shot touches a bit upon the other part of Tony Mendez that we don't get into so much in the film, which is the fact that he was this expert in documents and, and you know, sort of was, was trained as an artist. And, yeah. He's still an artist, he likes to paint, and that's really how he got recruited. But this movie doesn't really, like you say, doesn't require so much of that part of his story. His book was called Master of Disguise. My creation. This is one of my favorite parts. We just, you know, sort of invented some ridiculous sci-fi, you know, set and thing with these girls with these see-through outfits. Fuck, Ryan. Cut. We're cutting. <laughs> Chambers. John Chambers, make up. One of the great entrances ever, I think, <laughs> the way that you staged this. Yeah, this is at Warner Brothers, you know, where, Goodman, where uh, Chambers was, in fact, um, the head of the makeup department. He says the Minotaur prosthetic is too tight, so he can't act. If he could act, he wouldn't be playing the Minotaur. <laughs> and this is my favorite, one of my favorite lines in the movie. If he could act, he wouldn't be playing the Minotaur. Uh, it's just brilliant. And it gets a laugh every time. It's just, it's in the script from the beginning, and it's great. But it's sold because he says it and then turns and gives the warmest smile to the guy. <laughs> And using that music and that line to him in Hollywood and seeing Tony on the plane here, I'm trying to sort of finesse him into this new world. We had to change all this stuff, take all the air conditioning off the roofs and, you know, to make it period, take buildings out, take change cars. It was quite an ordeal for a shot that looked pretty pedestrian. Watch your head. Where are you shooting? This was based on his real uh, trailer, and I wanted to kind of fill it with, you know, masks and, you know, faces and makeup stuff and... Um, the first time we shot it, I didn't feel like there was enough stuff, so we went back and did some inserts and added some masks that you'll see here in a second. That It was like 110 degrees in Burbank this day. I know no one gives a shit about stories like this. That polyester shirt did not breathe. John Goodman probably sweat four gallons of water that day, and I was not far behind. It was a miserably hot day in Burbank. How are you going to get in the embassy? And this is the pickup reshoot edition of stuff. There was a bunch of great, you know, actors that, whose molds we had in there. What am I making? You kind of hit for the cycle. I need you to help me make a fake movie. Came to the right place. I want to set up a production company and build a cover around making a movie. That we're not going to make? No. So you want to come to Hollywood and act like a big shot? Yeah. Without actually doing anything? No. You'll fit right in. This is the actual smokehouse lounge. It's across the street from the real Warner Brothers, so it's very plausible that that's where they would have gone. This one's got an M.A. in English. She should be your screenwriter. Sometimes they go along on scouts because they want the free meals. Here's your director. You teach somebody to be a director in a day? You teach a Reese's monkey to be a director in a day. Look, if you're gonna do this, you gotta do it. My Reese's monkey line I, I, is the question I probably get the most, and it also gets a big laugh. I don't know the answer to whether you can teach a Reese's monkey to be a director in a day, but, um, you know, a day, two days, it's close. A week at most. <laughs> this kind of is a nice little touch, which is that he kind of belittles me by saying I'm an associate producer, and then it turns out that, uh, you know, Joe Stafford, who gives Tony the hardest time, he makes the associate producer. That's totally fictitious, but uh, I liked it. And this is just setting up the pitch so that the shot of Alan Arkin will will pay off, which I, I think I think is timed beautifully. I wanted John to have like the biggest old like late seventies car imaginable. It seems like he'd be getting a lifetime achievement award every other week at his stage in his career. This is Jaja Gabor's house where we shot this, and um, they were really accommodating. Her husband was really helpful, and so it was kind of kept the feel of of the place because it was sort of right for this 
as uh, you know, this, this, as Chris put it in the same direction, the semi-legendary producer in a semi-legendary 70s. You want to lie to Hollywood, a town where everybody lies for a living, then you get a sneak 007 over here into a country that wants CIA blood on their breakfast cereal, and you're going to walk the Brady Bunch out of the most watched city in the world. That's about 100 militia at the airport. That's right. Right. Look, I... I gotta tell you, we, we did suicide missions in the army that had better odds than this. Sir, the car is here. That's a, a reshoot. The scene was longer, and it, it took me a long time to finesse it, where we sort of built the tension of whether he was going to help them or not. I, originally, he said no while he was sitting down. He kind of made it final, and then reversed course. And in this version, it sort of stays up in the air a little bit, and he sees that footage, and that's what you know what tips him. But in order to make that transition, I had to get a pickup of the housekeeper saying that his car had arrived. We're going to need a script. That's taken from a photograph, that one with the Shador and the rifle. A very famous photograph, which is actually shown at the end of the movie in the credits. Here again, I'm trying to balance them sitting around this house, you know, doing activities that could look leisurely with you know, gunfire outside. Here, their marriage is under strain. And the introduction of Sahar as a as a possible mole and as a possible threat, which I think helps to take the tension outside and put it inside that house, because otherwise you feel that the house guests are in a fortress and that they're protected. But with the introduction of the Sahar plot, you, you worry that the threat could be coming from within the walls. I really like that it also, it takes the sting off what she ends up representing, which is something, you know, in a way, I don't know whether it's noble, but it's really beautiful to me because she represents the, the everyday person, the everyday Iranian, the caught up in the sweep of the revolution and of the violence and without any dog in the fight except to just, you know, you, you know, one imagines, you know, be with her family and you know, do her job and make money and um, that isn't a revolutionary, it isn't violent, it isn't crazed. Um, and that, uh, in the end, she ends up going to Iraq, I thought was also sort of nicely, um, you know, sort of prescient. Yeah, exactly. It seems like the safe haven. Of course, you know, a year later they fight this, um, you know, horrible war around Iraq, and then of course, you know, the, the uh, coalition of the willing uh, invades Iraq. Another decade and a half later, two decades. This is a reshoot again. I needed to do a pickup to get like I, that process of rifling through scripts. Uh, I wanted to make more sort of, you know, have a more sense of search searching. Hey, is A double O six still on the open list? A double O six is the name of my high school. Uh, is the name of my high school drama <laughs> class room. So there are like 30 people that will get that reference. Science fantasy adventure. It's a turnaround. It's dog shit. I think it's a space movie in the Middle East. Does it matter? Can we get the option? Why do we need the option? You're worried about the Ayatollah? Try the WGA. Yeah, I thought oh, that was very, very funny. That gets a laugh of people you, you wouldn't think know what the WGA is. You know, but somehow they get a sense of what it is. You want to go into production with this in one month? Up like a Connie ride. This was a hard scene, and I think Ben directed it really masterfully, which is to say it could so easily go into the realm of parody or, or even into something that's too what makes Sammy run, and yet and yet Ben keeps an even keel both in performance and in directing, and that you never feel that these characters are over the top and are parodies of themselves. I took this meeting out of respect because I wanted to say no to your face. Thank you. Very respectful. You're finished, Lester. Get your cataracts fixed. Read the trades. MGM just capitalized for it's Richard Kind, who I think is a very funny, um, you know, really talented actor, and who played this part, you know, very, very subtly and very small and very real, and helped make the the kind of dueling producers aspect of it feel real to me. It kind of worries me what you're saying. Let me tell you why. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in a trade of Vicks. I was enjoying a mai tai when my pal Warren Beatty comes in. He wishes me well. We had a little chat. I love how he pronounces his name Warren Beatty. Somehow that feels like more period or more. He said, oh, I said, what's Warren Beatty? Is that an alternate pronunciation? He said, oh, I don't know. Do you want me to say Warren Beatty? And I said, no, 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 I like Warren Beatty. So we stuck with it. It's actually my, my grandparents used to say Ronald Reagan. Like they, oh, really? they couldn't actually do the EA thing pronounced the other way. Maybe it is a period thing. Ain't worth the buffalo shit on a nickel. So the way it looks to me through the cataracts, I grant you, is that you can either sign here and take $10,000 for your toilet paper script, or you can go fuck yourself. With all due respect. You really know Warren Betty? Yes, I do. I took a leak next to him once at the Golden Globes. I took a leak next to um, Charlton Heston yeah. at the Golden Globes. That's where uh, <laughs> that, that that was that was Ben's line, and it always it always gets a big laugh. 
I always inspired me like that was the closest I came to Charlton Heston was staying next to him peeing at the Golden Bows. And this thing's, you know, I wanted to land them in, in this studio area where you could sort of see that things were half real and half make-believe and also to root uh, Alan and this the Hollywood stuff in, in reality so that it didn't start to just get like elevated from the rest of the story, you know, to, to hear uh, about his regrets and his life and to make him more of a real person and it also touches on, you know, obviously on Tony, what Tony's going through. Your wife and kids, you can't, you can't wash it off. You? And this is, when I, when I saw this scene, I thought, in a way, I start to see the threads between Ben's movies in that there, there's something about this tone of these guys talking that reminds me both of the town and even, and even reminds me of sort of Good Will Hunting. There aren't a lot of scenes where you see two men sort of sitting and having a meaningful talk about their lives and, and I think I think this was staged really beautifully and so simply that you don't see how interesting the uh just laziness. <laughs> There's the battle no, but, I mean that's how men talk, right? They don't look at each other. They yeah. just kinda of sit in a place, look off and occasionally glance over. Since the incident the number of guards at the We sort of had a longer build here and I, I ended up kind of trimming it so that it moved a little bit more and Again, needing to sort of remind the audience of, you know, the stakes and what's out there and these people are in this house and, you know, something bad could happen to them. This sci-fi poster was kind of a knockoff of the original Star Wars. If I'm the Revolutionary Guard, there's nothing we couldn't have made at home. Six people's lives depend on this. It's not enough. We're going to fool these people. It has to be big and it has to have something that says it's authentic. I did a movie with Rock Hudson one time. If you want to sell a lie, Get the press to sell it for you. No, no, no. Press event and then they're going to read through the script. Oh, they got a bunch of actors. They're going to read from beginning to end, all the way through. So the real um, storyboardist was Jack Kirby, who created, you know, co created the X Men and a bunch of really substantial, you know, important comic book titles. And, um, and it's just one of those, like, little things that we couldn't quite get to, but I wanted to show him getting the, the boards. Uh, this thing's an event, it's going to be a spectacle. <laughs> This is the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Again, there we took out a bunch of the buildings that weren't there in the late 70s. And some people have complained that the song um, came after January of 1980, but it in fact was recorded prior to that. This actress kind of improved her practicing her lines and really liked it. This young woman was saying that her father had threatened to like disown her for the outfit she was wearing. Here, you know, I'm trying to make it feel sort of, yeah, yes, it's absurd, and yes, you know, it's Hollywood, but it also it, it feels real, and we kind of sit in it for a minute and feel feel the energy of it, and because we're going to get comic here, again, this sort of, like, undulating tones of the movie. This is a master class in comic timing. You look fabulous. Mm. You doing the reading? I'm playing sexy, the galactic witch. Great, I'll call you. Keep that fucking space witch away from me. You know her? I was married to her. Oh my god, Iraq is amazing. Oh, we're shooting in Iran. Iran with an N. Yeah, we're very excited. You ever watch the news? Yeah, what does the title refer to? The Argo. It was the thing. Like Jason and the Golden Fleece or what? No, no, it's the ship. It's the, it's the spaceship. It goes, it goes everywhere. It goes all, all throughout space. Yeah, that little riff of all, all throughout space was just my favorite thing he did. Like he sort of lost his train of thought in the middle of bullshitting. It means Argo fucked himself. Yeah, you know, pretending he'd read the script. And now I go fuck yourself, obviously, the centerpiece of, of the film. <laughs> Our artist could settle in. We're just about ready to begin the reading. There's Adrian Barbeau there. Here I want to show a feather again. You could go from this, this read through, these guys trying to solidify their credibility as, you know, really making this film and sort of take a moment to wind us back into the heavier stuff here. The people working here no sense And that's the real Tehran Mary. And that's her there, and when we cut back to her, it'll be our actress. That these people are spies. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. The production department went to great pains to like recreate exactly this press conference. They did a great job. The world has changed. And this this bit of cross cutting here again is meant to sort of help you know mesh this stuff all into one movie. He says a gravitational field that strong will kill any. Rory was originally supposed to be doing the push-ups, and he was like, I don't want to do all these push-ups. Tate volunteered. <laughs> I like this sort of going back into the images that are similar but different. And it sort of touches on the themes that I think are really interesting in this movie. As terrorists, but itself and its CIA are the most terrorizing organization of all time. The story was told, but there are infinitely more. 
we find his ship, we will find our chance. Aboard the Argo lies my hope. My hero, my husband. We will begin the trials and carry out the sentences. We wonder where and how this seemingly endless parade of hatred will end. What do they want? They say the question should be not what, but who. I like that we put in this thing here where he throws dirt on their feet. I don't think it's real, but I just wanted some gesture that shows like something they somebody would do before they, they executed somebody. Someone was saying, oh, this is what would happen. And we had a lot of Iranians around sort of giving us various advice, but we were sometimes not quite sure if it was real, but I thought it was very effective and cinematic. You thought the performances, stuff like here, is just better with, you're just better off to have the hoods on and not, not kind of know what they're, not see their faces. And then later on, heard from one of the people who was actually there at that mock execution, which, you know, of course, is a real thing, and said the only difference he saw was that he wasn't extended the courtesy of having a hood over his head, that they, they were left to face the firing squad without hoods. The real Argo ad, except Lester's name has been added to it. Argo, fuck yourself. Argo, fuck yourself. And this originally, there was a longer sort of dog leg here where the mission had been canceled and he had to, Tony had to go back and try to get it on again. And instead, I just I compressed that and made it, made it sort of quicker. This is in the State Department. This is a real sculpture. This is inside the sort of quad at the State Department. Which is sinister in a way. It's this sort of God sitting on top of the world, which is exactly what, you know, if you're an Iranian, you think that's what the American Empire is, right? A scary God of war sitting on top of a globe. Brace yourself. Talking to those two old fucks on the Muppets. You know, Hard Eight and Midnight Run are two of my favorite movies, so this was naturally a pretty cool moment for me. Yes, sir. And his sort of deadpan questioning there, I think, is just perfect. Right now, that is funded by the CIA? Yes, sir. What's wrong with the bikes again? We tried to get the message upstairs. Sir. You think you think this is more plausible than teachers? Yes, we do. One, there are no more foreign teachers in Iran. And we think everybody knows Hollywood people. And everybody knows they'd shoot in Stalingrad with Paul Pot directing if it would sell tickets. That line gets a laugh in New York. All the screenings I went to, it was just crickets. It's just one. Dead, dead silence. You don't have a better bad idea than this? This is the best bad idea we have, sir. By far. And the sort of the best bad idea was really helpful in marketing because it kind of encapsulated um, the jam that they're in, their need to find an idea, their desperation, and their acknowledgement that, you know, this is a little bit half-baked. Once again, we had to like hurriedly put our, our ribbons up and then take them down after every take because the Park Service doesn't let you put ribbons up in Washington around the monuments. And that's Tony's real son, Ian, who the movie is, uh, there's a dedication to in the movie. This is Dulles. We took out some of the non-period stuff. And here you'll see the actual Tony Mendez with his family uh, do his cameo as, uh, after I get out of the car. This was shot in green screen in L.A., and we went and shot the plates for it uh, in D.C. because we couldn't sit there at Dallas Airport and film the whole scene. Pretty good green screen these days. I mean, part of it's because it's long lens and stuff's out of focus, but it's pretty it's pretty uh, seamless. They can do a great job now. Should have brought some books to read in prison. Nah. They'll kill you long before prison. Thanks for the ride. Yeah. So here's Tony right here, going walking by there on the right. And that's his wife and his family with him. Studio 6, we got a green light. Keep the office running until you hear otherwise. Now go fuck yourself. Now go fuck yourself. The home front, the amount of the home front we see and don't see is something that we, we worked on a lot and tried to figure, get the right balance of uh, understanding that Tony has a family life but not letting that plot distract you from the forward momentum of the, the mission. There was more in it on this, uh, you know, Tony's wife and his son, additional scenes with them in it. And I like the scenes. I think they're good. And the acting's, uh, Taylor's great. And, and, you know, it's, um, but it was just one of those things where he kept screening it. And it just felt like the movie would slow down all of a sudden. You know, you're watching this very unusual movie uh, about something really interesting. And then all of a sudden it would sort of shift gears into, into a storyline that you'd seen before. And a guy with his wife at home and struggling with his marriage. And, it, you know, it just turned out that just the amount we had in, have in now is all we really needed. Although that, that sort of, that, in a way, it's a cliche, I guess, in film, but it's very true because CIA marriages, uh, very, very few of them last, and you could see, you could see why. Because if you're always out of the country and can't tell your spouse where you've been or what you've done, then, then you, you know, this sort of forest grows up between two people that you can't see through. And I thought that was what was really interesting about it. Contributed to that lunch pail thing, the realistic CIA life. It just didn't. I couldn't find a way to make it work in the movie, unfortunately. And Taylor Schilling was so good. We shot some telephone scenes at the same time. It was just too bad. She pleaded with me. I started in the streets nine months ago. She, she 
that's for us to leave. She packed our bags. And I said, just a little bit longer. And all I was thinking was, stay. This is good for me. Stay. Newsom being the number two at the State Department, for what it's worth. Joe Newsom, you got the balls. When a, when a random proper noun is inserted into a speech. I think he plays this really well, and this begins to develop the Joe and, and his conscience plot so that you don't think that he's just being contrarian and being difficult in his desire not to join in at the beginning, but it's, it comes from a very real place. I think we're gonna die here. This, I wanted to feel like remote. I thought it would feel more real if there was like stuff in the foreground and it was from the vantage point of somebody really observing. And, the way that you really do see violence like this is not from a nice orchestrated shot, but just far away. And there's a kind of ignominious, ungainly, awkward, you know, he just sort of sits down after he's shot, falls over. And, and Ben based it on a real video, right? Of, was it Afghanistan? It was Pakistan. These yeah. guys in Pakistan shoot, yeah, shoot this young guy and he just sort of falls over like that. And it happens so abruptly and suddenly without ceremony that it's kind of jarring just in the way that it does in the movie, I think. The establishing shot you just saw is the Blue Mosque and this interior is the Hagia Sophia. So uh, it looks like it's I mean, a literal cut. In fact, I always took it to me. They're across the street from each other. Tony's walking around the Blue Mosque and ends up in the Hagia Sophia. Revolutionary state. CIA brief November 1st, 1979. And our movie company replaced every single light in the Hagia Sophia. So when you see you know, these, every single 4,000 light bulbs that we replaced, and um, we were going to have to put them back on the Sunday before they opened again. And then the guy came down and was like, no, they're good. Leave them. We like these. So they're still there, I guess. And I want to show that here you have in the Hagia Sophia, you know, it used to be a church, and then it was a mosque, and now it's a museum. And this, this east meets west, this sort of seeing the, you know, the Islamic prayers and then an image of Jesus, hopefully not being heavy-handed but and, and not indicating, but, you know, kind of conjuring up these images hopefully brings up, you know, some of these themes. This is Richard Delane, who I think uh, beautifully captures that mood of the old cynical spy in a, in a, in a fresh and interesting way. It was Ben's idea to have him be British. Originally, he was American. I think it makes him much more interesting to be British, to give a sense of the almost the English-American complicity in all the mess that became Iran. What will be the purpose of your visit to Iran? Uh, film production business. This is Rafi Pitts here, uh, who's playing this consulate official. He's a filmmaker in his own right. Not only his own right, he's a really just terrific filmmaker uh, from Iran. And I think you can get one or two of his movies uh, on Amazon. And you do yourself a favor of seeing them. They're really, really good. He's a good actor, too. He starred in his, his last movie. This, this detail coming up about the passport, I, I, when I put it in the script, it was based on when I, I went to the Congo, once obviously a region that Ben knows well, and I had to get a visa, and the stamp said Republic of Zaire. And at the consulate, they crossed it out and wrote Democratic Republic of Congo. And, and that always stuck in my head as... as an indicator of the fluidity of and, and the the you know just the the artifice that is a country Nation and that one states. country could become another country just with the stroke of a pen. It really inspired me to kind of explore this idea of the this transition of governments and how you know uh, new boss same as the old boss and a little bit of the uh, sort of animal farm feel that the sort of Stalinism of the Islamic Republic and the way that the um, you know the, the sort of when he goes and talks to this minister of culture and guidance um, you know you see the space on the wall where the Shah's uh, photograph used to be. And, and, it's just, and it's, it seems like it used to be kind of an ornate space and it's been, you know, stuff's been torn out of it, uh, kind of thinking about, you know, Iraq and the museums that got looted after the, um, after the invasion. And just the sheer presence of the face of the Ayatollah, I think, also is, is, it's not only just a historically accurate design flourish, but it says that, as Ben is saying, like, when a new regime comes in, half your job is the symbology of it and of legitimating yourself as a government with visual and narrative indicators. This coming up is this moment where this guy is detained, and I wanted it to sort of jump out at you and not be able to anticipate that there's going to be this problem at this sort of snatched out of line, and it'd be kind of jarring. And this guy, after I cast him, told me that his father was in fact detained at the airport and put into prison for two years and, you know, um, later died from sort of the mental illness that he incurred during his incarceration. And he wanted to say the things that his father said when he was detained at the airport. I said, you know, of course. And, uh, it's Azadi, it's something about freedom, and I thought it was incredibly moving. This is the Azadi monument, the 
it's, uh, you know, we created it. It's in Iran. Of course, we couldn't go there, but I wanted to have some specific Iranian detail in the movie so that when Tony landed, you, you really felt like you were there. <laughs> These women did not want to eat that chicken, and I kept having to tell them, you guys got to eat. That shot and that whole scenario encapsulates the contradictions that were in Tehran at that time, which is that you have, you know, you have Western influence, you have Kentucky Fried Chicken, you have Coke and, and all the sort of modern American brands, and yet you also have this uh, theocratic government and mindset that's, uh, that has parked itself in the country. Here's the Shah's, you know, photo, or farm, the place his photo used to hang. This film crew is just yourself? No, we have six more from Canada meeting us today. And I really liked when the script, the sort of, you know, I never wanted these people to become villains or, you know, one-dimensional. And it's really good. He's got a sort of self-awareness or awareness of the country, a sort of a sense that, you know, his people, his country, his culture is frequently sort of diminished or mocked with this imagery of, you know, flying carpets and snake charmers. And it makes him smart, and I, I kind of I like that. They're not just sort of mustache twirling and chasing these guys around, but they're a part of what was in this revolution was a sense of national pride, you know, rebelling against imperialism and having been under the yoke of, of tyranny for the Shah, that there was an intellectual nature to this, ultimately kind of co-opted by the mullahs, but it was real, it was present, you know, and, and I think it, you know, you need to, it needs to be real. He's sort of meant to look like Bob Evans a little bit with the glasses, and I just used, you know, we just, Jackie West, who's the greatest customer in the history of the world, just, you know, we went over reference photos together and just gave everybody a, a character, and then she went and found the exact clothing. It was remarkable. Mr. Best, Ken Taylor, thank you for what you're doing. Victor is a little bit older than Ken Taylor was. At the time, Ken was like 39, I think, when this took place. But uh, Victor looks so much like him. Andy's Canadian. I thought it was kind of perfect. And I love Victor, and he's great. He's a spectacular, wonderful man, wonderful actor. And this is true. The Canadians did uh, provide passports to the House guests, and in fact, it required a special act of the legislature in Ottawa to, to do so because it was kind of a, kind of a big deal to have government-sanctioned falsified passports for another country. That's something you should know. In various drafts, way at the beginning, I, I tried to have scenes in Ottawa where you saw some of that, but it, but it, uh, it, it ended up not, it wasn't feasible. Some of the problems of this movie is that, you know, to, to, to really do justice to the entire story and everyone's contribution from all over, you know, over the entire period of time, it would be a 10-hour miniseries. So the sins really are, are largely, uh, aside from the artistic sins, are, are sort of sins of omission. You know, you just, you just say you can't go into the stuff in Ottawa. It just, it becomes too much of a dog leg and you can't go into them almost discovering the you know somebody from the family talking and then uh, people in the press discovering that these guys are hiding there and then the need to get the press to agree not to print it because again you you're just sort of you know you're, you're getting too far away from the core um, spine of the story so what we tried to do was sort of gesture at those things for example you'll see when Jelko you know you saw when Jelko comes to the CIA that there's a whole subtext about the press you see in a conversation with Tony about the enormous risk that Pat Taylor and um, Ken Taylor undertook and you know, hopefully people will go read about about those things just from hopefully we can wet interest a bit in it. Chances are good. Good? Well, what's the uh, what's the number value of good? A 30% chance of being publicly executed? Well, well, we all, we all can you tell me what the objection was to normal cover identities? There, has to be more there are no Canadians in the country for normal reasons. Yeah. They'll sniff the, us out regardless. The Swedish consul, they, they accused him of being an American at the airport. They held him for an hour. We can't hold up under that. We don't know what the hell movie people do. And once again, this, this argument, this reluctance was important because I felt like the audience would be sort of, at this point, identifying with them and asking a lot of these same questions about why, why this was necessary. And, you know, f I wanted the audience to empathize with the fact that their lives really were in danger when they walked out of that house. And it wasn't a silly, jokey thing about a sci-fi movie. It was, it was real. And the six, in fact, aren't just MacGuffins. You know, they have a will of their own, and, and they're not, you can't go in and just extract them. They, they, uh... They have to be convinced, and that's part of Tony's job. It's not just to get them out, but to convince them to go along with the plan. But it is time to go. And this thing, when I, one of the things I did with this previous scene is just to do takes where I said, okay, now nobody say their line. Um, you know, just play the same scene, but do something different. And we had a couple of handheld operators, and what happened was that the actors were sort of improvising, and it forced the cameras to improvise, to not be sure who they should be kind of paying attention to. So you get panning back and forth, and you know, this sort of handheld feel. So you're like right there, and then they have to go focus to him, and the focus arrives late. It just feels like the way it does at a uh, high energy dinner table conversation where you sort of don't know quite where to look, and your, your attention, you know, you're sort of figuring out who to watch a half second after they start speaking, but without feeling sort of forced and, you know, uh, over caffeinated. And if he loses, it's our lives. And his life too. 
This is one of my favorite moments in his life, too, because Kathy is in a way the shyest of any of them, but she says the wisest thing, really, which is that he's taking on the same risk that all of us are, so maybe we should trust him. These cover identities were created specifically for each one of you. What you need to do is memorize everything that's inside. This is sort of a, a you know, you see this movie convention in a way, uh, you know, we're going to prep for our mission, we're going to learn our lines kind of a thing. Um, what I liked about this and what made it different was that these people aren't prepared for it. Um, they're meeting this like sort of on their heels, kind of stunned, very skeptical. What they're being asked to learn is ridiculous, but also their life depends on it. Oh, that guy kind of sucks. What's your name? M Mike McEwen, eh? That was convincing. Kathy, what's your name? This is this incredibly weird building that we found with this long staircase on it. We shot a take where that guy walked all the way up the staircase and um, not surprisingly didn't use the whole thing. I like in the movie, you know, people sort of blocking him and moving into the foreground and trying to make it as messy as possible. We shot this on two perf. Oh, and this was great. Having the lifeboat be preempted by the news, the, I thought the was great. Boat. You hear, you said, you said lifeboat, which I mean, is a is a deep subconscious. Oh, sorry, yes, <laughs> love boat. But here also bringing up the fact that you know we were already involved in a way in Afghanistan back then, and the notion that. It, it was touching on the gas prices, and it was touching on um, this conflict we had with Iran, and all these things, you know. Bad news, bad news, even when it's good. We've been dealing with um, in one way or another for decades. And here, when he says bad news, bad news, it's just, it, to me, it was so perfectly emblematic of the sort of malaise of the time. Uh, people just feeling discouraged and let down and hopeless, and it's what gives this mission a kind of wonderful impetus, you know. And, and wanting a, a cowboy to ride in and save them, which is an old Hollywood iconography, of course. I love this sort of low-tech, high-tech thing, like this is the phone scrambler, you know, but it's really just, like, looks like it's from Radio Shack. It's right, three days of the condor, the, the, right. the technology. So are all my corduroy jackets. They called your bluff. Again, that's outside, that's a green screen, and we really tried to meticulously reconstruct, you know, tear on night scenes, and it just looks like, you know, things glowing in the background. Are they even ready? They're getting there. There's no prize for most improved. I don't have a choice. We say no, they show up at the residence and drag everyone out at gunpoint. How well do you think their covers are gonna hold up when they're getting their fingernails pulled out? Now, this thing about the hive is real because the, the bazaar was where a lot of Khomeini's Center biggest supporters were. Center of revolutionary were, fervor. Right? Because, exactly, because they, they weren't the very poor and they weren't the very rich who were doing very well with the Shah. They were people who were educated enough to see that a different country was possible. And so they supported Khomeini. Many of them later on dropped support for him when they realized how repressive the regime was. The revolution was, you know, driven initially by students and secularists and merchants and communists. And, you know, Khomeini really used the hostage crisis and the 444 days of those people being uh, held there to marginalize the moderates and take control of the of the revolution in effect with this sort of either you're with us or you're with the americans kind of a thing once he he sort of realized that the hostage crisis uh, could be taken advantage of but he didn't uh, engineer it at least as far as anyone knows his son came the second or third day of it and sort of told the students to keep them there and this is another improvisation so they come up to tate late but i love that this is the ball game thing and it's all just sort of messy and improvised and that shot's underexposed but it's uh it feels real to me. It feels like the kind of conversation that you would have filled with tensions and overlaps and uncertainties and insecurity. The one where they're hanging people from construction cranes, Bob. It's too dangerous. I don't think my wife into the bazaar. And I like that he makes it about his wife there, even though it's not totally clear that that's, you know, the sum total of his objections. So we'll see you too. And these, these images of these students, they didn't really put together their, their faces, their pictures like that, but they did, in fact, do this reassembling the shreds of documents. And it was, this is absolutely real. I mean, you know, kids, many, many, many kids in there reassembling all this English language paperwork. That look exactly like your passport photo. I haven't been this nervous since our wedding. Only this isn't a huge mistake, hopefully. <laughs> This is based on something real, which is that there was a mysterious call to the ambassador's residence, and actually the caller asked to speak with the Americans, and it was unclear whether it was the press, whether it was someone in the Iranian government, or whether it was some government agency. But it was very chilling to the house guests when the call came. I had that line in there, and ultimately had took the line out and just made it a caller that doesn't speak, because when he said, can I speak to the Americans, the, in, in, in movie language, the audience came to expect an answer to that call. To just leave it dangling felt, in a way, distracting, but making it kind of mysterious and a little more oblique seemed to work better. I had this nice flare that comes when you go back up there that I really liked. It's materialized.
I wanted to keep the image of the mountains, you know, by Tehran. It's a distinct image. I love this dog. He was by the car rental space, and we saw him up there barking by the razor wire. And those arches are the reason you go shoot in Turkey, because you can't actually production design things that look like that. You just have yeah, to find exactly. it, right? Those are probably like Roman. One of those places where everywhere you go, there's some amazing thing that you're almost overwhelmed by the layers of history and people who have been there, just like Iran. Turkey and Iran are similar in that way. Where are they? In the kitchen. Ben really made the scene work. Um, originally, this little speech had ended with, my name is Tony Mendez, and he just gave his name. But Ben had the correct instinct that, that we needed more. He needed to reveal more about himself to seal the deal and say Tony's life is on the line too. And Tony isn't some disembodied fictional magic CIA guy, but that he, can, you know, he contextualizes his life, and I think that changes Joe's mind. I have a wife and a 10-year-old son. Yeah, and that Joe's accusation, you know, kind of against him is that he's just not, he's not putting anything on the line in a way. He's not saying who he is or anything, so he has to sort of, he has to give him that much. Fuck. And go from inside Hancock Park, California to uh, Istanbul. And these point of view shots were actually shot by this little, like, a camera on a kind of robot that was used to go around and get plates um, and they ended up being a few interesting cutaways that we used. I liked having the camera mostly just in the car over the you know over people looking at others where you have the background of the streets and it, just to make it feel as real as possible. And again street theater you know you have to go to like Costa Cabras or something to see a movie that I that I think to Ben's credit looks at street theater as as a crucial part of politics and looks at the sort of semiotics of street theater as a means to political power. What was important about this was just that these things were happening, you know, and continue, you know, continuing to happen in a way that political power was coalescing around Khomeini, but also it created this kind of you know, the worst place to be, you know, in a dangerous foreign country is in a crowd because there's a certain mania and people, there's a certain lack of responsibility for your actions. Like this guy right here, you know, just looks like he's sort of lost it a little bit. He's been whipped up into this tizzy. And, you know, in Iran, they're famous for the, you know, holiday celebrating or commemorating Hussein's martyrdom, uh, you know, whipping themselves and creating this, this like, very public spectacle. And that's part of the religious holiday, but it's also a tradition of, um, you know, public spectacle among a certain group of, of people. And, uh, and so that's kind of present here as well, and it's what was capitalized on. Um, during this period, um, between when the Shah fell and Khomeini kind of assumed total power. All right. Okay, tell me who you are. This was like sometimes in and sometimes out. I thought it took too long. But then I thought, you know, it's good to have Tony sort of focus their concentration again on what they're supposed to be doing and also remind the audience that, you know, who's just been through this sort of riot scene or protest scene, remind them like of, you know, what's supposed to happen next in the story, you know, kind of reframe themselves. The guide at the bazaar, who I, I think encapsulates a guy who might be like a grad student or something, you know, like a history student who, who does this. He's a little bit nerdy, he's a little bit wacky in his way, but I think he, he never he never goes into parody. He's got the enthusiasm of a guy who's kind of embracing the new way, you know, the revolution and what it's going to mean, and he's going to wear his nice suit and um, represent the country, you know, like that he strikes me as one of the students, the ideal, you know, idealistic uh, students in the revolution. There in the background, we added quite a bit of people. It wasn't nearly that long, but the Grand Bazaar in, in Tehran is so huge that I really wanted a sense of scope. And what he says here is real about the bazaar being on the, on the spot for 7,000 years. Every time I hear it, I think that sounds wrong, but in fact it's true that since the Bronze Age or something, there, there was a, a kind of market uh, on that site that then developed over many, many thousands of years into the bazaar in Tehran. And here's where I, just, I just wanted to try to capture extras and people that looked real, and I thought in the faces of people watching them, you know, um, you could sort of help show the audience that this was a real place because the people look different than what we're used to seeing. That the flash on that camera is completely digital. <laughs> the props guy didn't have one and uh, so we had to put it on. Here we moved through the real bazaar but we made it a little darker than the one in Turkey and um, it was a lot of top light, you know, we go there's these sort of squares of light that they move through. Judge Chicago. That psalm right there, 
terrific guy. He worked on the movie, helped translate Farsi. I met him on the Malik movie. Very cool guy. And here's the scene with Sahar coming up, and she, in some ways she's my favorite character. She's a great actress, and uh, what she represents, as we were talking about before, is something really important to the story. And this scene I use, like having traveled in foreign countries and some of the developing world, I've been in situations where some people just seem to get angry, you know, for and you're not sure what, and that's what makes it even more nervous making is that you don't know what they're saying or why they're upset, but they're really upset, and, uh, you know, there's something quite scary about that. That's okay, you can tell him you can have it. And then in a way it becomes specific when you find out that he's saying that the, the shot the killed shot, the son. Yeah. Yeah. The shot killed the son with an American gun, which again is hopefully some indicator of how policies that are made in those rooms, like the ones we saw at the beginning of the film, land in the lives of people a world away. And here we had some of this stuff, some was scripted, and more I just wanted to get this, this sense from the two of them. That this guy did not know how to fake it. It was very big and was grabbing and throwing people around. And they were like, we are getting beat up by this man. And I like the idea that's scary when, you know, you, a crowd attracts a crowd kind of a thing. And it's it just sort of becomes chaotic. And you know, the nice stuff, that guy was pushing me back. He was really legitimately doing it. I thought about, like, not having him in the scene. And I thought, no, he's the guy that should be in the scene. And here... You know, I like that his, his, you know, you're not able to tell whether he's sort of, is he really being kind? Is he really being inquisitive? Is there something behind his eyes? And they go through this kind of ritual of their conversation where they know what each one is supposed to say to show, to sort of like hold up their flag that says I'm part of this, of this team on a number of levels, on a religious level, on a political level. And uh, once they get past that, he puts this, this tester here, here asking who's staying with them. And I like that Sheila just, you know, sort of takes a second and her instincts takes over and um, she tells a lie to protect them, and in that way you see her basic humanity, you know? It's like a Renoir, you know, movie. This is one of my favorite filmmakers. There's always some of these moments where you sort of see the fundamental connectedness of, of people, and that's um, what I was going for here. And she's cool. She's like, she's a fine artist. She's a performance artist. She lives in L.A. She speaks Farsi and English, but she's very, she was brought up in like Palo Alto. <laughs> it's very much not the, you know, character she's playing. Tomorrow they'll be ready. And here it was like, we always went back and forth on whether or not, like, what was the, you know, what was the issue? Was it that they, they somehow failed? Was it that they were just identified and that, you know, kind of augured poorly? This uh, Oval Office set is one of my favorite ones in the movie. It was modeled exactly on the Chief of Staff's office. Uh, I kind of got a chance to, to go into the White House, um, you know, when the President wasn't around, and do some quick research and go into this office and check it out and take some video on my phone. And um, from that, they, they built it. And, and actually him. timed out some of the lines, right? I remember Ben saying he was counting out how many steps it would be yeah. going from... I read the dialogue from yeah. coming up the stairs and walking down the hallway and walking into the room. And so. The director performed the dialogue in the actual White House. <laughs> some comate guard is actually going to know that. If you're detained for questioning, they will bring in someone who knows that. Yes. Mary, who are the last three prime ministers of Canada? Uh, Trudeau, Pearson, and Dick and Baker. What's your father's name? Howard. What's his occupation? Fisherman. Where were you born? Halifax, Nova Scotia. Which date of birth? February 21st, 1952. Good. What's your job on the movie? Producer. This is one of those things where I gave all the... I told the actors to, like, if they would write, um, you know, an extended version of their backstory, we would put it into the scene. And uh, they should write it and give it to me. And Clea was the only one who did it. And so that's why... Um, she has that, more lines. <laughs> she has more lines, <laughs> I always like that she chose Halifax, Nova Scotia fishermen as her back, as the background, you know, because it, it, it's sort of unexpected and reminds you of what a, what a big and diverse country Canada is, actually. The pneumatic tubes I saw both at the CIA and the State Department that they're no longer in use, but that they had been, like, used to, you know, send information and notes and stuff. And so uh, I got inspired and wanted to do it, but then it didn't work, and we had to tie, like, a, you know, fishing wire to the little tube, and we spent a lot of time making that little thing go up at the beginning of that scene, the little tube. Go to black on green. Go. It all just changed. What? They're calling the game. You gotta come back. What? Joint Chiefs are planning a military rescue of the hostages. Delta Force has started training to storm the grounds. So, 
Now, this is a plot twist that involves Operation Eagle Claw, which people who know about the, the 444 days will be familiar with, which was the, uh, the failed rescue of the, of the hostages, which was in its planning stages at this point. Still very, very classified. It's unclear who knew what about the planning of Eagle Claw at various levels of intelligence. Six Americans get and it happens after our movie. You know, our movie's got this nice, you know, uplifting, you know, inspiring story at its, at its heart, I guess. And um, well, Eagle Claw, it was just a devastating failure. I think eight Americans died. And was really the, the dark cloud hanging over the bin Laden operation. Right. In fact, that was one of the reasons why they started, like, I think, special forces and special operations is because of the failure of, of Eagle Claw. And, uh, I mean, they had to leave hurriedly. They left behind bodies. Uh, Khomeini came and toured the site. It was really devastating. And by the new accounts, when one of the helicopters went down during the bin Laden raid, the first thing that everyone in the Situation Room thought of was, we're going to have Eagle Claw part, part two, which obviously, fortunately, it didn't turn out that way. I didn't want to overplay the, like, tortured kind of, I, I don't want to lie to you, but I have to. I, I thought it'd be interesting if Tony just, you know, went right into it. And as part of his instincts, you know, that's, that's sort of what he knew to do, is that sometimes you have to tell lies, even to people you really like. Here, Led Zeppelin allowed us to use the song, but they made they wanted us to put the needle on the right track and to change the label in the middle of the record, because when we shot it, it, it was just some generic thing. Yeah, and I consider those reasonable demands. In fact, I kind of got into it because now I had reason to get some money to do the effect. Next, I want you to burn the passports before you leave. If you tell them now, they panic. I think it's best if you just don't show. We tried so hard to find a song here that both they would be playing in celebration and that also that spoke to what was happening underneath the scene, which was Tony's devastation, despair, surrender. The Zeppelin song worked really well. Keeps on raining. The idea of this burning van, you know, I thought of when I was listening to this cue here, which is by a guy named Andrew Lockington, which is in my iTunes playlist for some reason. I don't know where it's from, but as I was thinking about the movie and preparing, and I was listening to this piece of music a lot, and it came to this idea of just sort of this odd, isolated image. And um, so I left it, left it in the movie, even though it's not our composer. It's oddly sort of Irish sounding, but it's at the root of what was inspiring to me about the story. This is, of course, Tony's low point, which hopefully calls back the early conversations about whether or not people like Jack and Tony will take on the mission or whether they'll let the state take the blame and not worry about the actual human beings in involved in it. So this is kind of his dark night of the soul. And the sort of call to prayer, you know, the 5 a.m. call to prayer is something that you get used to if you're traveling in a Muslim country, and I think it's such a nice hallmark of that. I wanted to use it there to sort of remind us where we were and also something that would work well over that sunrise mosque shot. You don't see John Goodman in a cardigan much. It's off. They want us to pack up the office. So the sunglasses were, like, non-reflective, and for some reason they look really dark on Alan Arkin. It's one of the really nice cuts that William Goldenberger, editor, I can't believe I love that, going up from my face down to the infant of Prague and back up to Rory, and you sort of, I like cutting between spaces and people, you know, in the case of these transition type scenes where you're not exactly sure where you are, and you're discovering it after you get there. The, uh, the time difference was something that was Plagued challenging us. and <laughs> bizarre, right, as we, I mean, it was bizarre to me at the script stage where I, I always had sort of, had to, had index cards with, you know, plus eight hours, plus... 12 hours, whatever the time differences were between the various time zones. And then Ben and, and Sheila, the script supervisor, had to go through and really figure out if, if any of the, if my time zone things made sense. I'm sure they didn't most of the time. Alan. Alan. 
We need to confirm those seven tickets out of Toronto, Swiss Air. And he shut that down. I say it's back on. I can't do it. It's backstopped. Hey, wait, 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 wait. What the hell are you talking about? Backstop? What the hell does that mean? Carter's got to say yes for us to get the tickets. Also, a real thing. Carter Carter did have to approve the tickets. He's um, talking about DS, which is the Directorate of Services at the CIA, which is the department that would that sort of controls disbursements yeah. and money for missions. Where's Angle? Uh, he's in the meeting. You pull him out. Pull him out! Thank you. Thank you. Say hi to the bus. Great. Say hi, we'll be fine. Thank you. Thank you. You two leave right now. We'll be on a train in half an hour. Good. And people really wondered what happened to Ken, and we looped that after he'll be on a train. I'll be on a train in half an hour. We wanted to make it, you know, people were really understandably worried about what happened to him and when they got away, whether they were safe. You were this close. Am I? Am I really that close? You are this goddamn close. I am not going to leave him at the airport with six people and his dick in his hand. You tell the director to call the White House. Do your fucking job! He had this tremendous energy when he delivered that line. and did a number of takes and tried some different stuff, and he had it every time. It was very... I got the feeling he was very satisfied by telling Keith to do his fucking job. First time anyone's going to ask you a question is at the first checkpoint. This was... Editorially, you know, there's a lot of experimentation about which what shots to use of them, when to come back to, to the CIA, when to come back to Tony. It took a while to get that right. We're a fucking spy agency. Find him! The second checkpoint is immigration. You're each going to hand them one of these. Because the audience needed to be able to kind of follow the drama of the yellow and the white forms and which che checkpoints to go to, but we also needed, you know, visually and storytelling-wise to be sort of fluidly moving along. Jordan's in the West Wing. He's not taking calls. Where are his kids? What? Where do his kids go to school? In movies, sunglasses can't reflect, otherwise you'll see the lights and the cameras and stuff, and so they wear these like non-reflective ones and they look like ink black. Always distracts me and bugs me. That's Fanchon Cox, who's the uh, phone receptionist who was in my high school drama class. So she gets the A006. That's right, she, she would get the A006 reference. A hold for the chief of staff's office. The third checkpoint is the trap. It's manned by the Revolutionary Guard. Most of them were educated in the U.S. and Europe, and all of them are looking for Americans. That's the Ontario airport in Ontario, California, and we were able to fill it with, you know, the um, vast majority of these people were, like, not only Persian but Farsi-speaking because there's such a massive Persian population in Los Angeles. It's close to half a million. And among the community, they refer to it as Tarangeles. We don't have the president's go-ahead. They are going to be captured. David, pick up! And so it worked out really well with the airport stuff. We were able to, uh, you know, we were able to get many more Iranian extras uh, than we were in Turkey. So that was sort of an odd uh, situation to be in, to have more Iranian people in America than the country next to Iran. Zurich, uh, it's under Harkins. I like that old Amdek monitor, you know, these little flourishes that remind us that we're in a totally different time, you know. They had smartphones, they would have been caught a long time ago. You'll see the real, this telex when the money gets approved is an actual, you know, copy of the real telex that Carter approved. Here's the, the famous Carter telex that's coming in. It's a copy. Copy DS. Confirm the tickets. Go! This actress was lovely. One of the things I liked was that she had British accented English. Many of the Iranians, you know, learned English from Brits. My apologies, I just came through. Or in the UK. And so they had British accents. Swiss Air says they pick up the tickets. Get the L.A. office, tell them to be ready in case they call. We told them to shut that down. We had some of the photos on the passports kind of sticking up, and they were a little bit like the corners were peeling up, and so we went back like, for this shot, for example, and visually put the stamp on and um, sort of tightened up the corners to the passport. Kind of amazing what uh, effects get used for now. Some people do Harry Potter's wand, and we do passports. I like the idea of some of these guys at the airport, you know, you see them in their hats. They were, they were bureaucrats and, um, you know, they were there during the Shah and, you know, they're there now uh, in this sort of transition to Khomeini because who else is going to do these jobs, you know? It's one of the mistakes, that, you know, the U.S. made famously in the debathification, which is firing all these civil servants. And so that then nobody, you know, could kind of run the country. This sort of position they're in, and you see the Revolutionary Guards there and one inside, 
position they're in of, of being the guys who know how to do this stuff, but also, you know, they had to obey the old guy, and the new guy comes in, and they got to pretend that they're sympathetic to him, and really, you know, these guys, you know, with their beards and their hats, you get the feeling they just want to go home and have dinner and see their wife. And then this Ali here is a true ideologue. When did you come to Iran? Two days ago. What was the purpose of your visit? Now, is this bit coming up? Did Tate forget his line and you told him, or was this actually staged this way that you remind him? He was sort of taking a long time. <laughs> Whether he forgot his line I, I or he was just enjoying and I, his and close up. He, uh, he, the thing I liked about Tate is that he made the choice to lie here and made it look, you know, like what liars, bad liars do, which is oversell the lie. You know what I mean? Like a little too smiley, a little too ingratiating. And uh, as a consequence, the kind of the mind, the subconscious mind knows it's suspicious. And I wanted to use that stamping to, to, to punctuate the cue and come out of the music there. And it was really tricky to do, moving it around, how much time to go before he, he said his line, you can go, because there were sort of like two buttons on the scene, the stamp and the you can go. And sort of eventually, I think it was just like, we ended up where we ended up. I don't even know if it was right. It was just, we're going in circles. There's an actor here, the guy who's taking our tickets, Prashad, who was just supposed to play this part taking our tickets, but um, at the last minute we needed someone to, to play the interrogator uh, in the, the tent inside the little cordoned off area. And he was so great that I just put him in and he, uh, he learned the lines and did it in Farsi and he's amazing. Here you see in this scene, he's just so, he understood that people with power are calm. You know, that, they're, that they can be kind of cavalier because they have the power. They don't have to yell and try to intimidate people that way. And here, again, you have a guy who speaks, he speaks English, which we learn later, and, and he clearly was educated abroad and is an international type, but he is, again, an ideologue, and he, he insists on speaking Farsi. In fact, one of the things, that's what he says right here, Tate, Tate speaks English, and he says in Farsi. In Iranian Farsi, other that thing, he says, this is Iran, we speak Farsi. He, like, objects on moral grounds, on philosophical, political grounds to speak English. They just, there were a lot of people there with a tremendous resentment of the Shah and the, and the West that supported him and the you know, fact that English became kind of the second, unofficial second language. And this is what, what that resentment uh, produced in this, in this character. And I think here is one of the places where the prologue pays dividends because you understand that these aren't just wild-eyed, angry masses. These are people with a specific grievance who are specifically directing the grievance toward Americans in the country. Here's a nice bit where you see that it's not that Joe is afraid, it's that he was genuinely, you know, concerned about the wisdom of what was happening. And when the time comes, he uses his, his linguistic skills. I think the real Joe Stafford speaks like six languages or something. He uses these skills and, and his sort of quick wit to um, you know, talk their way out of it. Because Tony, of course, doesn't speak Farsi. He's an expert in what he does, but not in that capacity. And he pointed to the girl at the bikini and was saying, is this you, is this going to be you? And then said, you know, here in Iran, like it was absurd that she was going to be doing some bikini-clad sci-fi movie there in, in Iran. No, I'm, I'm no, a writer. Shah Rath. Kevin, give me your story bites. Shah Rath, he says, the Shah left. The idea being like, you know, those days are over. It's actually, this was pretty successful. Many people don't realize that he uh, scoot looped this Farsi because you actually never see his face speaking that Farsi. We went through this, like, <laughs> thing a couple of times of what he says about the what the story was, of the storyboards. And you could have him to make the uh, laser gun sound effects, <laughs> which are <laughs> universal. We wrote it once, and a scoot learned the Farsi, and we looped it, and then we <laughs> changed it, and, uh, you know, we rewrote it, and, and uh, scoot had to come back in and do new Farsi. You don't go until we verify. He's got just the right amount of accent. You know, they put on like his English, it's just accented, but it doesn't feel cartoonish or caricature. The card upside. I have the card upside down there, but it was a nice little camera move, so I kept it in. That guy, Farshad, he was amazing. All his little reactions and ordering these guys around and, you know, additional Farsi, and he just was great. And he never overacted. He never made a thing out of it, you know? He always had this slightly 
beleaguered sense about him, you know, this combination of his like political indignity and like having to deal with all this bullshit all the time. And this, I, you know, I watched a couple episodes of The Fall Guy and I watched the fight scenes and I got obsessed with like the fight moves and how kind of indicated they were and over choreographed and, and that, you know, as viewers, we didn't, we didn't mind that then. And we have this whole different expectation of action scenes now. And this is the real variety. Brandon Tartikoff there, former executive. What amazed me was that they had these, like that's, that's an ad for, I think, Rocky too. But he's like, for your consideration, that's a Robert Benton ad. And there's the real Argo ad on the right. So we integrated that with the real movie ads. I really loved like seeing the young Hoffman and Meryl Streep and then boom, the black and white Argo thing it seemed to lay right in. We're going again! Those little steam producing orange cone things that were supposed to fake like going into the under the street were in every movie about New York City in the 80s. So that's an homage to that. Editorially, it was tricky to sort of cross-cutting between this and on the phone. Initially, it took way too long, you know, it was sort of overdrawn, and then we had it too quick, and we just kept feathering it and feathering it, and it was such a fine thing, you know, a little bit of time would throw it way off because the audience would feel manipulated and pushed too far, but you didn't want to make it too quick because then you would lose some of the drama, so it was one of the most challenging things about cutting the movie. Again, all, all credit to, uh, to Billy Goldenberg. All credit if you think it works, that is. If you don't, all blame to Billy Goldenberg. Sorry, pal. We're going to be in the movie. Call my agent. Sir. Sir. <laughs> Studio 6 Productions. Uh, may I speak to a Mr. Kevin Harkins? Kevin Harkins always strikes me as a slightly fakey sounding name, but in fact that was the actual alias that Tony used, so we used it. That was our big stunt for the movie. I have the like Swiss Air. I find like the, you know they have that weird sort of German, Middle German, French, you know, strange cross European accent. Uh, that's hard to place. <laughs> After he lets them go, he starts like berating his guys that work with him, and he's, he he starts asking for this another guy Masood to come down. I like that it was just thrown away. <laughs> Here, this is one of my favorite moments. When he gives the storyboards to these revolutionary guards, they go from being stony-faced revolutionary guards to you see that they're just, just kind of kids and how much they enjoy the storytelling of it. That's that kind of humanism that I tried to, to put in the movie as much as I could. Where we're appropriate. Somehow we managed to find, I didn't manage to find, uh, Ted Moser managed to find like a period airport van. Turns out they've had those things, you know, forever. They've been ferrying people out to the plane. Also extremely hot this day and we, we just boiled in this car. Out in the sun. Those mountains you see in the background are CG. There was no real plane, it's a fake plane. That shot feels very 70s to me. And I had to pick the shots where I could kind of tolerate the California theirs again. Again, fake airplane, we walked up into it like a, just onto a platform. I was amazed how, how good they are at getting this stuff, and how good the plane looks. I had really like questions about this. I liked some throwing her and I liked the drama of it, but I also know that the you know real Islamists, you know, have very strong feelings about women and so I decided that he was not a particularly religious guy, but more a politically motivated guy. <laughs> that is also a reshoot him shooting the door. Initially he didn't he just he kind of got through it sort of quickly by prying it open and I thought it'd be more dramatic if he shot it. Swiss Air 363. Green screen, this is all green screen. This was the first day of shooting. These, again, guys who are really Swiss, sort of speaking in their accented English. I love that this is the way they used to move around airplanes, like just sliding these plastic, you know, it looks like a game of battleship or something, and they're landing planes with it. The interesting thing to me about this scene is that the only person on the plane who's ever aware 
of the threat of the fact that they're being pursued is Tony. And so if any of the house guests gave you an account of what happened, their accounts would exactly match the accounts of the real house guests. But that in Tony's head, he understands the, uh, the imminent threat. Maybe this really did happen, and maybe Tony told me that. And he told me I wasn't allowed to tell anybody, but that I could put it in the movie. Well, th there, are, there, are, there, there are certain things like that in the movie that, that aren't officially documented. I mean, Tony hasn't really ever been able to talk about John Chambers because some of John Chambers' stuff was never declassified, so he's called Jerome Calloway in Tony's memoirs. And there are, there are some details like that that we know are real but, but aren't in the official account. I'm also called Jerome Calloway in Tony's memoirs. Here's the guys in the foreground that play in the background. Those are expensive effect shots because the camera's moving once again. CG plane, CG heat blast. Wanted to, always wanted to use this camera attached to a truck called a Russian arm and got to use it there. I wanted to use that as the last shot before the plane lifted up. And this is my favorite of the CG shots. It really, I feel very convinced that that's a 747 getting into the air. There's a Russian arm, and we come up, and none of that other stuff is there, the mountains, the railing, the plane. We just tilted up until, like, you could see Kmart and, you know, the rest of Ontario, but we erased it. It's, it never ceases to amaze me. And this is one of those, allow the audience to be relieved, and then take away their relief immediately. There's more drama. Chris found this wonderful little piece of symbolism of the alcohol. You know, that you can serve alcohol. It's like, somehow because it's not obvious, and because it's sort of about, like, I don't know what, drinking is celebrating. Hey. Because of the puritanical nature of the regime in Iran, something just makes it the perfect symbol for leaving Iranian history. It's like, and the idea that you have a huge celebration that the, you can drink is kind of a, I don't know what, feels American. And these guys, we did a couple of takes and they were just like, they were kind of mildly happy. And I remember coming in and going, guys, just, you know, your lives got saved. This is it. This is the moment where you let you can let it go. And the next take, this is all these shots are, are from the next take where they just, they felt real and, and alive and they felt relieved and you know cathartic and uh, they all nailed it kind of all at once. It was really, really interesting. There's no other moment like that in the movie where everything I used was all from one take. And this is where I allowed myself some kind of real movie score, movie, movie score, sort of, you know, orchestral, sort of big, swelling kind of thing, which I stayed away from because I felt like it undermined realism in some places in the movie where we tried it. I think performance-wise, these, these scenes are my favorite things because all these actors have earned these moments throughout the whole film by underplaying and by being subtle. So when you finally see Ben smile, it's earned, and when you finally see Brian smile, it's, it's earned. Here's a real Iraqi guy who uh, is playing the guard, and of course Iran and Iraq share a border, and a lot of people went to Iraq during this revolution and after. And, you know, we see these people who are suffering, and then to go right to the champagne, I was worried that it would sort of, it might be too much of a jump or it might feel too bad, but I, I think it's okay. I think, you know, the audience recognizes the incongruity of it and says it's okay to be happy for these people and okay to also understand that everything isn't okay. You know, a lot of people are in a very bad spot and having to struggle to get by and figure out their lives. We made history tonight. History starts out as farce and ends up as tragedy. Oh, it's the other way around. Yeah, who said it? Marx. Roger said it? <laughs> Very few people can smoke the fake cigarettes and make them look like real cigarettes, the cloves, but Brian really could. It seemed like he was not only a smoker, but was smoking real cigarettes, and neither was true. I agree, them too. Only. Canada takes the credit of the retaliate against the hostages. Great Satan wasn't involved. No CIA. Is that right, Jack? Involved in what? We were as surprised as anybody. Thank you, Canada. We knew that each day... Now, this is real footage, again, from, you know, that we found from old news sources. And I, I wanted to reroute the audience in this idea that, see, this really happened, a, a sliver of really good news. This is, it really came home. Joe Stafford. <laughs> Kathy Stafford. Mark We've been away from that feel for a long time. That's the plate we shot in the State, uh, the state Department. That is the State Department. This is a little tip of the hat, as I say, to the hometown uh, hero, Tip O'Neill. I grew up in his district.
Bob Anders is holding that Welcome Home Bob Anders sign. Canada will pay. And uh, this is one of the eeriest and, and, and best flourishes from the real news footage where they actually threaten. I mean, literally, you know, an Iranian government official comes on and threatens Canada. It's, it's kind of amazing. An official who was later arrested and executed That's by, right. by the government. It's sort of like the French Revolution, you know. Sort of like, just devours itself. Why can't we do something like that? I said to her, you know what I said? And that one shot of me on the phone, I used a, a diopter, uh, in an effort to sort of homage to all the president's men, where the background is in focus and the foreground is in focus. And uh, there you go. It's the kind of thing you hear about on the DVD. And then this is the Raiders of the Lost Ark scene. That's right. It was deliberate on our part in, in some senses. But, you know, I got a, I got an email from Kathleen Kennedy, one of the producers of Raiders of the Lost Ark, who was saying that um, right at the moment that this was happening, she was in Tunisia filming Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> and so it was chilling to her to think this was going on not, not too far away in the... In the Middle East. This is in front of the CIA, the real CIA. And as I walk through there, there's a huge like 9/11 boundary there, but it's it's taken out. Obviously, it wasn't period. We're slowly running out of light, and so you see some of the shots of Brian have real sunlight on them, and some of them have uh, artificial light. And uh, you can kind of tell by how much shadow is in the background, which is which. You're getting the highest award of merit of the clandestine services of these United States. Ceremony's on the 14th. If they push it a week, I can bring you in. This is winter break. Boom. That's artificial. The op was classified. So, the ceremony's classified. You can't know about it. Nobody can know about it. So they're just gonna give me an award and then they're gonna take it back. That's right. If we wanted applause, we'd have joined the circus. I wouldn't have used that, but it's just such oh, a dear. good line reading. Uh, Carter said you were a great American. Great American what? He didn't say. That comes from the fact that when I would meet Tony's colleagues and people at the CIA, they would constantly say, this is a great American right here. It's like, it's like that's, some, that's some catchphrase that they're constantly using at, at CIA and in Washington. What happened to your picture? It's a turnaround. I don't know if the people remembered that a turnaround meant that you know, it wasn't being made by the studio, it was being turned around. I think more it's just people get the intent. I always went to that shot of the toys in the foreground sharp and the father coming home soft in the background. Here we have an American flag that's in the shot there. It's not meant to be sort of jingoistic or flag-waving or shrouded, wrapped in the flag, but just a kind of neighborhood in life where a lot of people, like you see the house behind them, have flags on their uh, homes. It's not been accused of being sort of, uh, I don't know what, flag-waving by some. But that's not it. It's just a, a sort of literal, I thought, a piece of realism, and I thought it was interesting because it's different from today, at least in many parts of the country. This is Taylor Schilling, as you can see. She's wonderful. There's the flag blowing, and it looks a little bit like a car commercial, uh, but it's not the intention. This to me is, is uh, this really touches me, you know, a son with his father, a son waiting for his father to come home. Even though it's not a very big part of the movie, it, in some ways it was the most, uh, one of the most meaningful to me. And the whole idea comes from Ian, you know, so, so in a sense Ian is the seed of the whole plot. I always knew I wanted to do these cards on the toys, the adventure toys, the fantasy toys, the storyteller toys. The, they'd been off, you know, like, now he's home, and somehow this is the fairy dust that's trailing behind him, or these are the um, trophies from his adventures, and this is the imagination of his son. And um, I don't know, it's, I just, I love them. Maybe it's because these are the exact action figures that are right out of my childhood, and those books I had. And they look like they're from the 40s or something. This is something that really sticks with people um, who I've talked to that, you know, it took until President Clinton to declassify this uh, so people could know about it. The next Democrat. Yeah. And here's this, this lasting image, which to me, you know, speaks to Tony and who he is and behind the story. And it's the most, maybe the most personal frame for me. And this here, this credit sequence, we wanted to, there's the real John Chambers, you know, on the right. So we're showing images from the movie and those from the research, or some like this that are just from the research with Chambers with his Oscar. Just because I think, you know, the nature of the movie is such that it's, it's so hard to believe that uh, it's just nice to have this stuff at the end to kind of look at and help cement in your mind that it's real. And also every time I go to a movie, you know, I love the cards at the end and I love stuff like this. So I thought, well, I'll indulge viewers like me who kind of can't get enough of the 
what the drama was rooted in. These are all our house guests. I think we have a number of them interviewed. You can see on the DVD a lot of you have Ken Taylor, um, Tony, people who are talking about the things that you know we couldn't include in the movie because of time. Uh, you can hear them talk about their experiences, and uh, it's well worth doing. There's Kyle, who you like forget about by the end of the movie, and I see this every time. God, he was so good. Our production designers completely recreated, like down to the wardrobe and the look of the people at press conference. They just did such a great job. Even with the Khomeini sign, you know, trying to reproduce this, those moments of climbing over the embassy. That's the real kids with the you know, classified material that had been shredded that they put back together. The Hollywood sign was, in fact, in terrible disrepair. Hugh Hefner started a campaign to raise money to fix it, and it was subsequently fixed. There's that photograph I was telling you about earlier of the woman with the Shador and the machine gun. And there's the men hanging from construction cranes. It's the inspiration for this. And here we have President Carter talking. I wanted to do that not because I want to make this a referendum on the Carter presidency or because I want to say, you know, see, this was you know, right or this was wrong, but rather just if you have the guy who was the president of the United States at the time this took place saying, yes, and there they are visiting him in the White House and saying, yes, this, this is real. They pretended to be a movie crew. You know, it kind of is incontrovertible. It's gone down in CIA history after his retirement as one of the 50 most important CIA operatives uh, of all time. There's Tony and the president in the Oval Office. Uh, after finishing his mission, kind of moving, pretty cool. And we upheld the integrity of our country and we did it peacefully. And there it is. That's our movie. Um, thanks for joining us. If you're still awake uh, at the end of this commentary, you can write in for a prize. We had 120 speaking parts. We had so many great actors. You can see a bunch of names here. These people all really, really did such a great job, and I'm so grateful to them as well as uh, the, the crew folks who follow. You know, you get to have your name on there as director, and but it just doesn't mean anything without people doing this. You cannot make a good movie without really good actors, without a really good crew, and without really good, particularly without good material to work from. So um, I'm really enormously proud of this movie, and, and in many ways because of the shoulders that I stood on, you know, and that's the people who um, I was lucky enough to work with on this one, and I hope hope I get a chance to do so again. It was a real pleasure, and I want to thank all the guys who worked on the DVD, Craig, and everybody, you know, uh, who put all this stuff together. There's a lot of work that goes into doing these extra features and bonus features and Blu-ray stuff, and uh, I'm really grateful just because it gives the movie a little more life, and it's great to have it as an archive for the people who are really into um, this story. You know, there's, there's a lot more to see here, so I hope you enjoy it, and um, thank you for, for uh, sitting in, and thank you, Chris. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Great score, too, by Alexander Desplat. It's just a lovely... Rodrigo Prito, cinematographer, amazing. Sharon Seymour, production designer, did a great job, as you can see. Sheila Waldron, script supervisor. Uh, Colin Anderson, the operator, steady cam, the camera operator, steady cam. Uh, you know, it just was blessed with so very many great, great, talented people. And I hope they'll come back if I get another job. And also, definitely merit thanking uh, our producers, George Clooney and Grant Heslov. Uh, and I got to thank executive producer Shay Carter, Tina Anderson, our post supervisor. William Goldenberg, as I mentioned, an excellent editor. David Webb, the first AD, did an amazing job. Chris Brigham, the line producer, Amy Herman. Deborah Ricketts found all the footage for us, the stock footage researchers did a great job. We had great researchers in general. Oh, and you know, the DI, Ivan Lucas, um, we, uh, you know, coloring the movie. And it was uh, all the guys who helped us from doing our anamorphic to, you know, the Hawk lenses and the, the um, the two perf stuff, it was just a the camera department. It was an enormous challenge, and they rose to it. And all shot on real film. All shot on film. Motion picture film. The last purists that remain all, all <laughs> Ben and, I guess, yeah. me and three other people. Oh, and Alex and Zainab in Turkey really put it together. We, uh, we, our, we had a great Turkish bunch who really helped us um, get, get through there. Really uh, so many great people. And this movie, in a lot of ways, is kind of a tribute to our foreign service who, who go out and risk their lives. And, sacrifice for their country and the folks in the clandestine services and the sacrifices they make and uh, we are we are mindful of those and grateful for those and uh, it, it was really a pleasure and an honor working with so many people from the Department of State and from the Central Intelligence Agency. I also want to thank uh, the director of Petraeus, Secretary Clinton, and I want to thank everybody who uh, let us use their their music. It really made a big difference. And that uh, lullaby is something that I just I heard with the well rocking my first child to sleep. And I always thought it was it would work really well in the movie. I tried to use it in the town and it didn't work really well, but uh, I then uh, put it in here. And it worked.
the State Department, the CIA, and Tony Mendez, of course, we have to thank. And uh, you know, that's our movie.